quantum computers are always faster. That's a misunderstanding. Why can quantum computers break encryption? And how do current computers create encryption that start? Quantum computers break encryption. Current computers create encryption. A quantum computer isn't fast because it calculates quickly. It's fast because it can break encryption. Richard Feynman, whom many of you know, was the first to talk about this. Nature operates precisely in a quantum mechanical way, but our computers do not. Trying to imitate nature with a computer that doesn't work that way is extremely difficult. So, he suggested that if we just build a computer that works quantum mechanically, wouldn't we be able to imitate nature exactly as it is? That's the background behind the emergence of quantum computers. A quantum computer is still a computer, so it's correct that it represents information in zeros and ones, but it makes use of quantum mechanical phenomena. The quantum mechanical phenomenon in question is called superposition, zero, and one can exist simultaneously. An electron might be here or it might be there, but as soon as you observe it, it appears in one place. In quantum mechanics, you ultimately use zero and one to compute. But because zero and one are superposed, you can perform the calculation all at once. The core principle of a quantum computer is that you must not observe it. If you observe it, it collapses into either zero or one. Therefore, you have to compute without observing. This is difficult. You do not observe it. The moment you check whether it's zero or one, the superposition breaks, so you don't observe it. In quantum mechanics, as I mentioned, even a tiny speck of dust hitting it counts as observation. So how do we build a quantum computer? You either create a perfect vacuum, or drastically lower the temperature, or fix everything in place so nothing moves. This makes controlling it hard. You must achieve a perfect vacuum, and if it collides with another atom, it breaks down, so you have to prevent that. The core principle of a quantum computer is that it must not be observed. If you observe it, it collapses into either zero or one. Therefore, you have to perform calculations without observing it. This is difficult, you do not observe it. The moment you try to see if it's zero or one, it breaks the state, so you don't observe. Now, what does observation mean here? As I mentioned in quantum mechanics, even a tiny speck of dust colliding with it counts as observation. So how do we build a quantum computer? You either create a complete vacuum or drastically lower the temperature or fix everything so it can't move. This is how it's done. And controlling it is challenging. You must make it perfectly vacuumed. If it collides with another atom, it breaks down, so you need to prevent that. Why bother using a quantum computer, then? People say that quantum computers are faster than ordinary computers, but that's not entirely accurate. They become faster only in certain cases. Why do they become faster? It's because a quantum computer uses the superposed state directly. With 0 and 1 superposed, for instance, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 10, 0, 11, a classical computer would have to compute all four of these separately. But a quantum computer can handle them all at once in a single operation and then pick out the result you need. At that moment, it becomes faster. For example, when you use a navigation system to find a route, say you want to go from New York to Los Angeles, it shows you several possible routes after you pick a spot in Los Angeles. A classical navigation system might say, if you go this way, it takes two hours. That way takes two hours, 30 minutes, and another way takes three hours. It gives you all these options. But if you run this on a quantum computer, what happens is that out of all the various routes, it only shows you the single route that takes the shortest time. That's why it's fast. It can't show you how long the other routes take. Once you observe a single result, the superposition collapses to that one answer, and that's all you get. But if you think carefully, this doesn't mean it's always faster. Why not? Because the reason a quantum computer seems fast isn't that it calculates more quickly per se, but that it can reduce the number of calculations needed. If you had to do four calculations, now you can know the result in just one calculation, so it seems faster. For example, if a classical computer needs to do 100 calculations, a quantum computer might only need 10. You might think that would be faster, but how long does each calculation take? If our current computer takes one second per calculation, that's 100 seconds total, just over a minute and a half. If a quantum computer takes one hour per calculation, doing it 10 times would take 10 hours, which is obviously slower, so it would actually take more time. That's why you can't simply say it's always faster. It depends on both the number of calculations and how long each calculation takes. You can't simply compare them this way. Right now, our existing computers can operate at about 1 billion calculations per second. That's tremendous, isn't it? Quantum computers don't reach that level yet. 
Therefore, even if you reduce the number of calculations, it doesn't automatically mean it's going to be faster. You can't just say that every country is now declaring we're going to build a quantum computer. And companies are also announcing we're going to build a quantum computer. There's a huge fuss about it. Why are they doing this? Because in our current state, we can only solve a few very specific problems. But if a truly functioning quantum computer were developed, what kind of problems could it solve? It can break encryption. That's why everyone is in an uproar. It means all existing encryption could be broken. How does a quantum computer manage to break encryption? It's extremely difficult to explain in full detail, but you can understand it in a simple way. Think carefully about how encryption works right now. If we want to create our own secret code among people who know each other, we need something in common. For example, suppose our home is on the 10th floor and we decide to add 15 to that floor number. This resulting number becomes our code from now on. Only the people living in that home would know this secret, while others would not. That's how we set a password. Every day, you enter passwords on your phone, and whenever you do banking tasks, you also enter a password. All these passwords work in a similar way. But here's the problem. When I exchange information with the bank, when I enter my account number or card number, everyone can see it. How can I send it secretly, even though everyone can see it? That's the issue. We establish passwords in this way. Every day, you enter a password on your phone, and when you do banking tasks, you also enter a password. All these passwords work like this. But here's the problem. When you're exchanging information with a bank and entering your account number or card number, everyone can see it. How can we send it secretly, even though everyone can see that's the issue? So, how do we do this? There's a method that allows everyone to see what's going on while still maintaining security. That's what we call public key cryptography. For example, let's say there's a person A and a person B A has a secret password that only they know. Let's say my password is 2. B also has their own secret password. Let's say my password is 3. Then there's a publicly known number that everyone can see. Let's call it 11. Everyone can see the number 11. What do we do then? Person A takes their secret number, 2, and multiplies it by 11, resulting in 22A makes 22 public, so everyone can see it. Person B takes their secret number, 3, and multiplies it by 11, resulting in 33, and makes that public. Now everyone sees 11, 22, and 33. Everyone can see these numbers. If people cannot perform division, they can't figure out that the secret passwords are 2 and 3, so what happens next, A and B agree on something. B, who produced 33, gives that to A. A takes the 33 and multiplies it by A's secret password 2, resulting in 66. Meanwhile, B takes the 22, which A produced, and multiplies it by B's secret password 3, also resulting in 66 now. Both have 66. From here they say, let's add 10 to 66. The new number is our final password. This is why even if everyone saw the initial numbers, 11, 22, 33, they still don't know the final secret password. The crucial point is that everyone can do multiplication easily, but if they cannot do division or factorization, they can't reverse engineer the secret numbers. That's how current encryption works, by relying on the difficulty of going backwards, factoring. But people can do division, right? So what's the trick here? The encryption we use is based on very large numbers that are incredibly hard to factor. However, a quantum computer can solve these factoring problems efficiently. That's why quantum computers threaten all existing encryption. If a quantum computer appears that can do these calculations, all of today's encryption can be broken. That's the key issue. Technomics.